This presentation builds on two previous discussions of research ethics, this time focusing on some values and practices, best practices in research ethics. Several professional associations have created a code of ethics, as we mentioned in a previous video. Uh, and out of that, we see some commonalities across professions, such as achieving valid results. We want our research to not deceive, essentially. Uh, so we're not just doing pseudoscience, forcing some kind of political agenda, something like that. Our goal should be to build objective knowledge, and that ties into the, the second principle of honesty and openness, which means that we're, we're going to be completely an open book when we do research. If there are limitations, we need to shine a light on those and raise that so people know uh, exactly what our research can tell us and what it cannot. And a good practice here within different scholarly communities is to publish critiques of research, pointing out weaknesses, being critical of one another, and then offering chances for rejoinders, back and forth debates. And out of that should come a culture or set of norms of kind of a critical perspective uh, that we keep each other open and honest in our research. On the principle of protecting research participants, there are several key points to consider. The most obvious, of course, is the no harm principle, but that's closely related to informed consent, which grows out of the principle of autonomy in the Belmont Report. We need to consider researcher disclosure. People should be willing participants and not be deceived into research. That does uh, pose some problems for uh, deceptive studies, which we'll discuss. Uh, and we need to ensure the benefits outweigh risks and keep the identity of individuals anonymous or confidential so that their participation in the studies are not advertised. The application of ethical principles is complicated by a few gray areas mentioned in previous videos. One of those is the use of deception in particularly experimental research when the researchers have a need to conceal some aspects of the research design and that may infringe upon the ability to obtain informed consent. People don't really know exactly what they're signing up for in other words. Uh, and that does create some questions which need to be sorted out typically by the Institutional Review Board who will make a decision about the ethical nature of the research. Another consideration has to do with the legal protection of researchers. Uh, there is an ethical responsibility to those doing research that they not be harmed as well. And if they are studying groups engaging in illicit activities, such as Rick Scarce, who studied the Earth Liberation Front, which was dubbed an eco-terrorist group for their property destruction, he refused to reveal the identity of individuals to the authorities and was jailed for obstruction of justice. Now there is something called a certificate of confidentiality that one can obtain as a researcher that will give them the same kind of legal protections a lawyer would enjoy or a professor when it comes to student information. There are legal policies that protect that kind of confidentiality, but going into research, no such legal protections exist in a de facto sense. They have to be obtained through the certificate of confidentiality. The final concern that complicates the application of ethical principles is the use of research. Uh, the big question here has to do with values and it, political agendas and there is some debate here on to what extent researchers should be concerned about the political and social and economic impacts of their research and the knowledge they're producing and, how, and give some thought to how it may actually affect the world. And that, of course, is an open debate. And that's going to uh, conclude our discussion of ethical principles and a consideration of some issues that may complicate their application. Thank you.